Well, hello. My name is Evan Reese, and on behalf of the U.S. Resiliency Council and our series sponsor, Optimum Seismic, welcome to this fourth event in the Seismic uh, Resilience Advantage webinar series. We hope you've had a chance to enjoy previous webinars and video episodes, and uh, we really hope you're looking forward, uh, as we are, to this episode uh, with our focus on resilient communities. The USRC is a nonprofit organization. Uh, we were founded 11 years ago, and we work to improve community resilience one building at a time. We believe that the, uh, in the power of building performance rating systems, uh, educational programs like the Resilience Advantage, and coalition building with a wide variety of stakeholders. Uh, we, we do all this to transform our built environment in the directions it needs to go towards a more sustainable, uh, equitable, prosperous, and resilient future. So with that, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Ali Sahabi. He's the co-founder of Optimum Seismic. Uh, you've seen him before uh, uh, on our episodes. He's really a leader in sustainability and resilience. Uh, it was his vision that set us on the path to create this series. Uh, Ali, this has been the longest uh, I've gone without seeing you in person over the past three or four years. Um, it's very frustrating. Uh, you know, I miss our times down in Los Angeles. I know in 2019 and 18, we got to give a lot of great in-person uh, seminars to to just a wide variety of folks. I miss that. Um, but we're doing the best we can with COVID-19. Isn't that right? Yes, Evan. Uh, it's nice to see you. Yes, uh, I agree. Uh, um, it was different in person we, uh, with our seminars and so on, but we're doing the best we can and, uh, and we have done a lot that we can be proud of. Uh, with that, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of Optimum Seismic, I'm truly honored to participate and support such a timely and important educational program in collaboration with Evan and USRC. We started our partnership almost four years ago. A lot has happened since then, as Evan mentioned. But I'd like to share with you a major milestone. Last month, FEMA submitted a comprehensive report on earthquake resiliency to U.S. Congress. The report is titled Recommended Options for Improving the Build Environment for Post-Earthquake, Reoccupancy, and Functional Recovery Time. A mouthful, but very relevant. In fact, this report validates the work we have been doing for years. We intend to send you a copy of this report via email after this webinar. But for now, I would like to share with you the seven recommendations that was highlighted by the report. One, develop framework for post-earthquake reoccupancy and functional recovery objectives. Two, design new buildings to meet recovery-based objectives. This is what we talked about last episode. Retrofit existing buildings to meet recovery-based objectives. Design, upgrade, and maintain lifeline infrastructure systems to meet recovery-based objectives. Five, develop and implement pre-disaster recovery planning focused on recovery-based objectives. Six, provide education and outreach to enhance awareness and understanding of earthquake risk and recovery-based objectives. And finally, Seven, facilitate access to financial resources to achieve recovery-based objectives. In addition to this report, we're pleased to see FEMA's new building resilient infrastructure and communities, also known as BRIC program, which shifts the federal focus away from reactive disaster spending 
towards research supported and proactive investment in community resilience. This is what we've been looking for for some time to change the shift from being reactive to proactive. The fact that it makes sense in business and economics terms to be proactive. Through BRIC, FEMA will continue to invest in a variety of mitigation activities with an added focus on infrastructure projects and community lifelines. This is another confirmation of our efforts. Again, we're very proud to sponsor the Resilience Advantage. It's been tr a true collaboration. And I would like to take a minute to recognize our major partners. Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce, Los Angeles County Business Federation, Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation, and US Resiliency Council. At this time, I would like to thank our champions for today's episode. First of all, California building officials. We're a very proud member of the organization that does so much uh, for our state. As you all know, building officials are really, uh, th they are part of our front line uh, in any kind of disaster. And we really appreciate what they do for us every day. Also, uh, we're a very proud member and uh, of Long Beach Area Chamber of Commerce, which is the second largest city in Los Angeles County. We're really happy to have Shane Diller from Calvo and Jeremy Harris from the Long Beach Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for being with us and, uh, and supporting us in conveying the important messages of our series to your membership. Thank you. And now, Evan, please tell our audience more about the Resilience Advantage webinar series. Thank you. Thanks, Ali. That's uh, our, that's great uh, introduction to um, uh, our guests, but also to the the programs that the federal government, our state governments, are starting to um, uh, put out there. I think that's really uh, going to be something we're going to be exploring uh, in the near term about how we can. Uh, make our audience, make our members uh, aware of all those federal efforts to move towards resilience. So the goal of uh, this series, this year-long series, is to tell the story of how investing in readiness for natural disasters can benefit us. Uh, each episode focuses on one part of that story, uh, making January's episode on new construction different from what you'll see in March about retrofitting existing buildings, which is different from April's episode on the intersection between uh, green design and resilience to achieve true sustainability. We'll be talking about incentives. We'll be talking about rating systems, science and technology. Uh, we have a whole series of really interesting uh, topics for you. Uh, our other ambition was to really communicate in a contemporary way uh, with on-demand videos using visuals, uh, plain speak, uh, and of course the memorable people and experts that you see uh, uh, on the episodes along with really interesting case studies about the real world uh, uh, ways that people are uh, putting together uh, resilient projects. Uh, and I, I do want to take this time in particular though to thank um, uh, our producer of this series, Compassion Unlimited, David Scharf and uh, Ross Willett have been working incredibly hard uh, behind the scenes to make our videos uh, look good, to get them done on time. Um, uh, we've conducted over 30 interviews and have more planned uh, and all of that takes a lot of effort to put together. So really want to thank uh, David and Ross and Compassion Unlimited for doing such a great job for us. Okay, we're going to get started with our uh, our, our video. Uh, this episode you're about to see was not easy to produce uh, because the term community means just so much to so many people. Uh, and the bottom line, though, is 
that what we really decided was that the key thing that really connected everything was our interconnectedness, right? We're all in interdependent. So our goal is to show you how important something like preserving affordable housing, for example, can be to employee retention and risk management for businesses and investors. It all works together. I uh, will also show you, uh, show you some of the win-win solutions that can move us forward with each of us that are a stakeholder in our communities playing a part. Uh, we hope you enjoy this production and stay tuned following the discussion with our panelists and our guest moderator, Cheryl Rabinovich, who is the uh, Director of Strategic Communications uh, uh, for the U.S. Resiliency Council. So with that, um, I'd like to show you uh, the benefit of resilient communities. Welcome to the Resilience Advantage, a series brought to you by the U.S. Resiliency Council and Optimum Seismic. I'm your host, Evan Reese, and we'll be exploring what resilience means to our communities in the face of natural disasters like earthquakes, hurricanes, flood, wildfire, and now even pandemics. Whenever we see the damage caused to buildings, no matter what the hazard, we have to remember that structures themselves are just shells in which the functions of a community happen. In this episode, we'll be talking with a number of experts about whole community resilience and how we can make progress in achieving that goal. From individuals and families and the stability of their jobs and housing, to businesses large and small that provide employment, services, and tax base, all stakeholders benefit when the resilience of any part of the system is increased. To get started, I'd like to introduce Cheryl Rabinovich, a public policy scholar and consultant who plays an important role in the work the U.S. Resiliency Council is doing to address community-level disaster risk reduction. Well, Cheryl, thank you for joining us today. So why do you think that it's important for us to have an episode devoted to community resilience? So we have to, especially in this moment in history, um, take a pause and recognize who it is we're trying to serve with our disaster risk reduction work. Uh, there's a lot of audiences who are affected by disasters who aren't always involved in the conversation about what to do about them. And there's no doubt that we have a disproportionate impact of disasters on already vulnerable groups. Uh, can you tell us what vulnerable populations are and why they're at more risk than other parts of the community? Well, inequality uh, is real in America and around the world. Um, unfortunately, it's not just inequality in income. It's also inequality of exposure to risk inequality of access to the factors of recovery. There are many reasons why people might be more vulnerable than the average person. For instance, children are in a developmentally sensitive time in their bodies and minds. Um, an elderly person can be more vulnerable health-wise. They lack mobility and they're more dependent on others. Cheryl, in our own conversations about disaster policy, we've talked about the disaster cycle. Can you introduce that concept to those in our audience who may not be familiar with it? Well, natural disasters are something that we have to live with. There are always going to be floods, earthquakes, fires. So if we don't pay attention to that cycle and do things better the next time, learn the lessons from the last disaster, we're just going to end up in the same place again. Each new disaster is an opportunity to learn lessons and apply those before the next emergency strikes and we can improve. In an interview with Lori Schumann, National Director for Enterprise Community Partners, we talked about what can and has happened when we aren't learning the lessons and making pre-disaster investment in our community building blocks like housing, water, and power systems. Enterprise Community Partners is a 40-year-old nonprofit that works to create opportunity around the nation uh, to support the most vulnerable uh, communities around the need for housing, economic development. So how does the performance of buildings in a community affect the ability of vulnerable populations to recover quickly and thrive after a natural hazard, like an earthquake or a hurricane? One of the things I found in my work in the early days is once someone ended up on the street, once someone became displaced from their house or was homeless, um, everything fell apart. It was very difficult to build a life um, when you have no home to come home to. To me, 
housing is the most fundamental building block of a community. It is um, the foundation, the walls, and the roof by which a community has to uh, survive. And what happens when you don't address these vulnerabilities in advance? You end up with a situation and a perfect storm that will lead to uh, substantial damage and destruction, and it becomes 10 times harder to fix it after it is broken than it is uh, to repair it before. Um, it's worth saying that, you know, Katrina occurred about 14 years ago, and still much of the Ninth Ward has not been repaired. If we look at Galveston, Texas, uh, close to 80% of its affordable housing was lost from Hurricane Ike, uh, and not even 60% uh, of that has been rebuilt. A common misconception is that what happens in other countries, even very developed ones like Japan, or even U.S. territories like Puerto Rico and Guam, is not relevant to the risks we face in other parts of the United States. I spoke with Daniel Zapata of Degen Kolb Engineers to ask him what can be learned from past disasters in other countries. Uh, so Daniel, I know that you've traveled to a lot of earthquakes in your career. Why is it so important that engineers do that? When I went to my first earthquake reconnaissance, I always thought of uh, the buildings themselves. But I think uh, as time went on and I, I was fortunate enough to visit a few countries, I started to realize the importance of not just the building itself, but also how it affects the community. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the Mexico City earthquake in 2017. Why is what happened there relevant to elsewhere? There's a misconception oftentimes where you go to a different country and people, you know, they say, well, that's a, that's a different country. We have much tougher codes. But I think one needs to realize that those countries actually mimic their codes and standards after the U.S. Uh, and a lot of those older buildings were actually built with similar codes and standards that we either use here in the U.S. or used to use here in the U.S. So what are some pieces of advice or some lessons about how the community needs to take a holistic approach to resilience and not necessarily just focus on individual buildings or leave it to the owner? The, the big advice that, that I think I would give cities in the U.S. Um, we really have to look at the community as a whole. If those buildings are not serving their intended purpose right after an event, it's gonna affect more than just the owner or the resident, the user of that particular building. It's gonna affect us all. When buildings are damaged in natural disasters and people are forced to leave their homes, businesses are doubly impacted by the damage to their own buildings and also by the lack of customers and workers. I talked to community leader Tracy Hernandez, who as founding CEO of BizFed in Southern California, is in a great position to explain the perspectives of businesses on community resilience. Uh, BizFed is the Los Angeles County Business Federation and the Central Valley Business Federation here in California. We're a massive network of already established business networks into one federation. They uh, represent and have 455,000 employers or companies here in California, and those companies employ 4 million people. So Tracy, how do business leaders like your member organizations view their role in creating community? How is quality of life for everyone affected by how the economic sector is doing? The epicenter of the strength of our community is the strength of our business and vice versa. And of course, businesses are some of the biggest uh, taxpayers and contributors, so they provide the water and the public safety and the tree trimming and the road repairs and job creation and then moving up the job ladder to higher paying jobs, all of that matters. And we can only do that if our economy is thriving. So resiliency and planning and public infrastructure, all those things matter. And anyone who employs anyone here in California understands that and cares about it and wants to be a part of the solution. I also spoke to Santa Monica Chamber of Commerce leader Laurel Rosen, who talked about the sustained commitment to education and investment that's necessary to help businesses take action despite all their other challenges. Santa Monica has a long tradition of organizing to support community preparedness, embodied in their local organization, SMOAID. 
SMOAID, which is Santa Monica Organizations Aiding in Disaster, was created with uh, founding members of the Santa Monica Red Cross and the Office of Emergency Management and other organizations and agencies, including the Santa Monica Chamber of Commerce. The goal of this organization is to not only provide the type of resources and directions and support that our community needs after disaster, but there's a lot of educational components that are part of the preventative part of dealing with disaster and what, in, what to do next. So Laurel, why did the business community get on board with Santa Monica's retrofit laws and are so supportive in general about resilience, sustainability, and promoting community well-being? So uh, retrofit is something that's really important in our community for so many reasons. We know that there's uh, over 1,400 buildings that have been tagged as vulnerable buildings in our community. Our city has done their job on reaching out to those businesses to let them know that they have uh, responsibility to correct this and to move forward and make their buildings safer. We have consistently tried to get that information out to the businesses and the community at large to make them understand that, as we have said for many, many years, that it's not if, it's when. What would motivate building owners and developers in particular to invest, say, an extra one to three percent of the building cost to go from a building that is safe but maybe not salvageable to one that is resilient and functional after an earthquake? What, what I would say is many people uh, need to really think bigger about the, the consequences of earthquake and vulnerable buildings. It's not just about losing the building. Uh, there is a cost that is uh, attached to that, obviously. And the cost of paying for retrofit versus losing your building, losing your business, potentially having employees, customers, clients lose their lives, and the liability that's attached to that, that's something that could change someone's life for the rest of their life. So we feel it's our responsibility to help our region with that message. Let's turn now to some of the ways different stakeholders are making it happen. Let's start with one promising model, the public-private partnership, sometimes referred to as P3. The new Long Beach Civic Complex is a powerful demonstration of what's possible under a public-private partnership model. Long Beach is a city well familiar with the consequences of disaster. In 1933, a magnitude 6.4 earthquake caused extensive damage throughout Long Beach and surrounding communities. 120 people perished. Damage was most significant to poorly designed and unreinforced brick structures. Within a few seconds, 120 schools in and around Long Beach were damaged, including 70 that were completely destroyed. Fortunately, the quake struck around dinner time. If children and teachers had been in school, experts estimate that casualties would have been in the thousands. This dodged bullet helped inspire passage one month later of the California Field Act to outlaw further construction of unreinforced masonry buildings and establish state supervision over school facility construction. Around 2010, officials in Long Beach noted seismic weaknesses in their city hall and port buildings. In Long Beach, we have a great program in place where we are really assessing by working with our business community, homeowners, and public agencies, all of the buildings across the city. We wanna make sure that all buildings, not just our own public buildings, are safe for all residents and for everyone that lives here. Working closely with the community and assessing needs over the course of many meetings, the city developed a project that ultimately grew into a four-building, 600,000-plus square foot civic center, which now houses the new city and port offices and meeting chamber, a beautiful new centerpiece public library cleverly constructed atop an existing parking structure, and it was certified under the Ready Rating System, developed by Arup for using design and planning criteria to enable owners to resume business operations quickly after an earthquake. The $520 million project was a massive undertaking that couldn't have been possible without the partnership that the city forged with plenary Edgemore Civic Partners. The innovative public-private partnership model has brought a revitalized civic core to downtown, which serves residents with public spaces, attracts visitors, and provides safe and efficient city operation. 
The Port of Long Beach, partnering this time with Caltrans and the U.S. Department of Transportation, created an earthquake-resistant cable-stayed bridge, the second largest in the country. The holistic approach Long Beach took to meet the closely interrelated needs of local communities, as well as regional, national, and international economies, stands as a positive example for other communities as they move toward a more resilient future. Not every resilient design project occurs at this kind of scale. I asked our experts about other approaches out there for projects of a smaller size that bring community resilience benefits at a variety of levels. Um, I'm very sympathetic to owners who make the argument that if the whole community benefits, then there ought to be a bit of a fair share in terms of who helps pay for some of these societally improving steps. Um, the, when there's compelling community benefits, the justification for offering public incentives is even higher. And I think the case is really strong here. One program that many listeners may be familiar with is the FEMA Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. It's changing its name to Building Resilient Infrastructure Communities. And actually the new administration is discussing raising the amount of money that's available in that program dramatically. And it gives um, communities, tribes, and states the opportunity to propose mitigation projects that are gonna make a big difference in the level of exposure to harm in those locations. Cities like San Francisco, Berkeley have taken advantage of that money and put it to great work upgrading schools, offering a grant program for owners of tilt-up concrete in their community where they've required a retrofit, but they're also able to offer a program to help subsidize those retrofits. The leading uh, tool for construction of affordable housing is the low-income housing tax credit, and it has led to the creation of uh, hundreds of thousands of housing units around the nation. Um, and then there's a stack of additional funding that's layered in with LIHTC uh, coming from a variety of public subsidies from HUD. Um, USDA has subsidy in rural communities and tribal communities and other set-asides. An important trend is the growth of local programs, including inventories and voluntary or mandatory retrofit requirements to address known vulnerable building types. We, for the multifamily buildings, we can talk specifically about the Los Angeles soft store, story ordinance that was passed a few years ago. We've done a cost benefit analysis of the Los Angeles soft story ordinance where we looked at sort of the range of costs that it would take to retrofit these soft story buildings. And what we were able to show is that on average, there's a three to one ratio in terms of benefits to cost. Now, something that our study did not look at is, you know, other types of socioeconomic benefits that even though we did not quant quantify it, it's something that you have to think about. We can point to about 10 or 15 largely California cities that have adopted in particular retrofit ordinances for various building types that are known to be higher hazard. The city of Fremont was actually the first city in the Bay Area to adopt a soft story retrofit ordinance. And now Southern California has got on board. We have LA, we have Santa Monica, we have West Hollywood, um, Burbank has some policies, uh, there are a number of cities now that have taken on these successful models and tried to replicate them in their own communities. Those ordinances are available as models, so you don't have to start writing your ordinance from scratch. What I would say to cities that are worried about going to the mandatory policy step is that there's a lot of options they can take short of that that will still do a lot of good. One of them is to inventory vulnerable buildings in your community. Another option is to implement a voluntary program. So once you get information out to the community about the fact that these vulnerable buildings exist and there's things we can economically do about those problems, 
uh, a lot of owners will actually see that information and take the opportunity to fix the problem without being made to do so. Um, that happened in the city of Berkeley. About 25% of owners voluntarily retrofit their multifamily apartment buildings uh, after the city passed a voluntary evaluation ordinance. Camilla Seth is a USRC board member and expert in finance in the foundation and philanthropy community. I spoke with her about how we can leverage donor programs. So the role of philanthropy is to address the most significant, in some cases seemingly intractable challenges that we face as a human society. And so I think climate change, issues of economic justice, um, and a whole range of other, other public sector issues are really the realm of philanthropy. What philanthropy can do, and the unique role of philanthropy, is to identify something that has not been sufficiently addressed and to seed new ideas and to help get them to scale to a point where perhaps government funding will come in and, and you know, kick it to the next level. And so being in the middle of a crisis like we're in is in fact putting a big bright light around this issue of resilience and preparedness. Institutions of all kind, whether it's philanthropy or business, or communities are realizing the costs of a lack of preparedness. But disaster resilience is something you need to ensure and to address. Why? Because we're facing disaster after disaster after disaster. Cheryl, what are some of the key messages you're hoping our viewers will take away from this episode? What benefits one benefits all, and what benefits all benefits one. The investment I make in being safer and more prepared myself relieves the burden on the city to take care of me after an event. And when I support local policies that raise up the bar on how buildings are constructed in my community, I'm gonna have access to services. My job is gonna be intact. Fewer of my neighbors will move away. Uh, I'm gonna see the benefit from that too. Another thing I want to say, Evan, is that these kinds of investments are achievable. So there's demonstrated projects out there that financially, technically, logistically have shown these types of uh, investments are possible. And a third message I'd like to get across is the urgency. Uh, we have seen from past disasters what our future might look like and we have to act today if we don't want to be there. There's no doubt in my mind that spending the political capital and financial capital before a crisis hits is going to save communities money in the long run. And prevention is the best medicine. We've seen how whole community resilience is a win for everyone. It benefits the physical and psychological health of the general population and the social and economic well-being of the community at large. Tools like public-private partnerships, local programs, and strategic philanthropy can achieve results that reach far beyond local populations and economies. Our next episode focuses on retrofit of existing buildings, addressing the economics, technical how-to, and the benefits of bringing older buildings up to modern standards for safety and potentially beyond. Thank you for watching and please join us next time on The Resilience Advantage. All right, well, uh, thank you so much for uh, watching that episode. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Um, and thank you to all of the, uh, the experts that were part of our uh, interview team there. Um, there was one question uh, in the chat uh, that I want to try and answer right now, and then I'm going to turn it over to Cheryl. Uh, there was a comment we not talked about with the FEMA BRIC program called uh, the Building Resilient uh, building resilient infrastructures and communities. 
Um, federal government always has an acronym for everything. Um, that program does not replace what some of you in the in the public sector may be familiar with, which is the hazard mitigation grant program. That program, after every declared disaster, money is made available to cities and counties in the disaster area. Uh, and that will still be ongoing. In fact, there are several um, outstanding uh, HMGP uh, notifications open now. The BRIC program uh, assigns money to what used to be called the pre-disaster mitigation program which was before a disaster ever happens, a city or a state can submit a project um, that it thinks would prevent a future disaster. Now, with the BRIC program, hundreds of millions of dollars more every year will be added to that program so that we don't have to wait until the disaster hits before, you, um, uh, before people can start actually making their community safer. So with that, I am just going to introduce uh, Cheryl Rabinovich. Uh, you saw her, of course, in the video. She's our Director of Strategic Communications at the USRC, uh, been a friend of mine for several years, uh, and she is going to moderate uh, our panel discussion. I will be in the background uh, watching the chat box, so if you have any questions, I'll relay them to her and we'll get them to the panelists. So Cheryl, take it away. All right. Thank you, Evan. I'm excited to be here on behalf of USRC and to talk with all our excellent panelists um, more about the topics raised in the video. Our format here for the next 40 minutes or so will involve a few questions for each of the panelists, uh, hopefully some back and forth in discussion. And as, as possible, as you're able, get those questions in um, and we'll try and address what we can. So let's start with a quick go round of self introductions. Um, maybe Shane, you can go first and each person can give us just your name and affiliation, who you represent. That would be great. So Shane, take it away. Make sure we get our your sound going. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm Shane Diller. I'm the president of the California Building Officials. And uh, Calbo is uh, an organization, professional organization of over 500 uh, member agencies uh, representing uh, building departments throughout the state of California, both cities and counties. All right. Thank you, Shane. Um, Lori Showman is next. Good morning. Or good afternoon. Good morning to our colleagues on the West Coast. Good afternoon to the East Coast. Uh, my name is Lori Schumann. I'm the National Director for Enterprise Community Partners Resiliency and Disaster Recovery Work. Uh, we're a nonprofit uh, that's been working for over 45 years to support communities across the country that need affordable housing. Um, the work that I specifically lead involves ensuring that housing that is vulnerable to a variety of risks uh, is preserved and protected from those risks, earthquakes, fires, flooding, uh, because we know that there's an extreme shortage of affordable housing across the nation and every single unit that is destroyed um, means that there's less housing uh, for a household and uh, it's very difficult to replace affordable housing. Um, housing, as I mentioned in the video, is uh, the cornerstone of communities' resilience. Um, so Enterprise works across the country to make sure that we have the housing we need to preserve, protect, uh, and produce it. Thank you. It's good to be here. Terrific. Um, Jeremy Harris. Thank you. Good morning. Appreciate uh, having me on this morning and uh, great to see so many familiar faces. Um, special thanks to Evan for hosting and special thanks to uh, Ollie at Optimus Seismic as well uh, for all the wonderful work that they're producing, um, especially going back the last three or four years. My name is Jeremy Harris. I'm the president and CEO of the Long Beach Area Chamber of Commerce and we are the premier business organization here in the Long Beach era, area region. We have over 700 members. Um, we're a professional staff of seven, serving a uh, cross-sector of businesses, both large and small, and all kinds of um, uh, industries, as you can imagine. Uh, we serve as the catalyst for business growth, the convener of leaders and influencers, and a champion for a stronger community. And those three tenets are very important to us. And I'm looking forward to talking more about that and also about um, having a resilient community. So thanks again for having me on. All right, great. And Jeffrey Fullerton, thank you. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Fullerton. I'm uh, Senior Vice President of Real Estate Development for Plenary Group. Uh, Plenary was the lead developer in the Long Beach Civic Center project that uh, was mentioned in the video and uh, a leading developer of public-private partnerships 
uh, around the world really, but but across North America, and uh, all of our infrastructure is essential infrastructure. So we're very keen on the idea of uh, resiliency for um, keeping people moving and, and employed, and then working in their critical buildings. Great. So each of you and your areas of expertise clearly play an important role in the themes of today's episode and webinar. Uh, I'd like to start with Lori, and you did a great job bringing up the centrality of housing to how communities survive and thrive. Um, maybe you can say a little bit more about what you see in your work about what safe, affordable, and resilient housing can do, uh, not just for the residents, but also for the broader community. Thank you so much, Cheryl. So it's worth, it's worth first, um, defining what we mean by affordable housing. Affordable housing is housing that provides shelter uh, to workforce, to older adults, to individuals with supportive needs, to families, to teachers. Um, this is housing that is the critical building block for our, our communities. And so when we talk about the need for affordable and safe housing, we're talking about the need to ensure that our communities are strong and safe we launched a program yesterday called Keep Safe Miami, which looks closely at Miami's affordable housing stock. And we seek to ensure that multifamily housing specifically has the tools and the resources to mitigate impacts from a changing climate in Miami. Every single affordable housing facility has a different set of um, requirements. Um, it is true, and Evan and I have spoken about this over the years, that uh, unfortunately, the majority of our conversations around mitigation and uh, adaptation of housing tend to be very single family focused. So Enterprise has taken a very specific look at the majority of affordable multifamily housing um, with an eye towards renters that need support. And multifamily housing is a very specific topology which has a very specific set of needs, technical needs and financial needs. Um, and certainly in Los Angeles, um, you know, it is true that this particular housing stock uh, has a separate set of um, development needs. So uh, we look closely at multifamily housing uh, because it is the cornerstone of most rental housing. On the other areas we've been looking at is uh, manufactured housing or housing uh, in rural communities that don't necessarily have stable grid connection. Um, and over the years, we've built tools to try to figure out what does it mean to have a resilient home, uh, what does it mean to construct a resilient multifamily housing? And there's a lot of a lot of ways and uh, and and ways to do it. I think, you know, in in conclusion, I I would say that one of the big questions for our industry is how do we pay for it? Thank you. Um, I that was one of the reasons why we tried to bring financing out prominently in the episode, um, because. People usually agree this is a great aspiration, but show me the money is what it really takes sometimes to get it done. Um, you, I, Thank you for defining affordable housing. Um, I wanted to introduce another term that some of the audience may be familiar with, which is uh, NOAA, naturally occurring affordable housing. And we always have that challenge, the balance between preserving the housing that we have now um, and producing new units. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what you see as being needed in the communities where Enterprise is doing work. Thank you, Cheryl. The Enterprise Los Angeles team uh, sponsored a program three years ago uh, with uh, a great showing up of colleagues and developers from across Los Angeles and the Southern California region to talk about a new ordinance that, uh, that Mayor Garcetti had issued to ensure that soft story housing, multifamily housing, uh, had uh, was going to be uh, needing to get retrofit because of the earthquake and seismic risk. Um, so we pulled together a couple of hundred stakeholders to talk about uh, what do we do to ensure that affordable housing, uh, multifamily, soft story specifically could get the support it needed. And a lot of what came out of that conversation was exactly, Cheryl, as you pointed out, there is a largest of naturally occurring um, affordable housing out there owned by you know, generations, mom and pops, 
new immigrants to the communities that have purchased their building, uh, and now they have to run this building with very little income. You can't raise rent. Um, and you also now are getting asked to retrofit these facilities uh, because the mayor is issuing mandates. So one of the issues that came up was, how do we ensure that they have the support they need to do this critical um, work? Uh, and so again, it comes back to funding. There are uh, a lot of HUD subsidized and federally subsidized units in Los Angeles, um, but even those do face the question of how do we retrofit for seismic stability? There's about latest estimates, 520,000 additional units of affordable housing needed in Los Angeles to just cover the needs of Angelinos that don't have a home, that are over, uh, that are living doubled up. Um, so the issue is pressing. And if we have a seismic event that disturbs any of this housing, naturally occurring, subsidized, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. The displacement rates and homelessness rates will double, triple, and quadruple. This is a very significant crisis. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I might turn next to Shane, who is coming from the building official's perspective. Um, you guys are often the gatekeepers to projects moving forward. So I think it's really great to have a building official input on this topic. And maybe you can open the box a little bit on what building officials do and the role they play in the process of both upgrading and new construction of any type from housing to businesses in office space. So, yeah, sure. You know, and specifically in California, each of your local agencies, your city or your county has a, a building department that acts as the, the gatekeeper or the frontline of defense for building safety. And we review construction projects and remodel new construction and remodel projects to ensure that they comply with the most current versions of the California building codes. And whether we're talking about, uh, uh, you know, sustainability requirements like we have in the energy and green codes or very strict fire life safety standards that we have in the California building code or in the California residential code, you know, our staff uh, first make sure that the, the plans uh, for the construction comply with those codes. And then once the construction's underway, we have various waypoints of inspection to make sure that what uh, someone is having built uh, remains compliant with those approved plans so that the user and the occupants of the building, which are really the most important piece uh, from our standpoint, uh, remain safe as the buildings are used. And we're proud in California that we tend to be a leader in, uh, in innovative and in uh, new uh, building practices, whether it's from a resiliency standpoint or from a, uh, a sustainability standpoint, California uh, does lead the way. Officials can actually play a really pivotal role in supporting a city and moving forward in their policies, recommending updated adoption of it, the most current codes. Um, and helping people through their actual projects. So I appreciate their role quite a bit. Um, are you seeing any new trends in the kinds of projects that are being submitted around the state? What kind of um, impressions do you have from building officials about how some of these local programs are working and uh, what we can do to help building officials move, move them forward even faster and farther? You know, we, we see a lot of, uh, of construction in what we call infill development, where you're taking and revitalizing areas or you're repurposing buildings. So when you talk about uh, you know, taking an older building like we saw in the video and some of the, uh, the hurdles that those buildings face in either coming up to current code or even being you know, more aggressive in their safety uh, plans than current code. You know, we try to help guide them through the possibilities there with being able to repurpose old buildings or to build in, uh, in areas that are uh, being redeveloped or repurposed, uh, similar to what you saw on the Long Beach project. So we still see quite a bit of that. 
Uh, one of the, the key terms I think we use when we talk about local building officials is that it, it's truly local. You know, every agency has their own flavor, if you will. And though the uh, the codes are, you know, are a statewide mandate from the Building Standards Commission, each agency has the ability to adopt uh, more stringent standards. And uh, provided they make certain findings, they're able to, based on the geographic area they're in, especially if they're in a seismic, uh, a high seismic threat area, they're able to go in like we saw in uh, in the uh, LA area and with Fremont and adopt more stringent standards than what the state may require of everyone else. And we, you know, at Calbo as an organization, try to encourage our members to, uh, you know, to really find what's, you know, what's best for their, their city or their county and what their built environment is needing and then provide resources and training to where they understand, you know, what some of that cutting edge technology and strategy is that they can implement, you know, either through local amendments or uh, just in education with their design community. Turn now to, to, to special guests. Um, who can help us explore a little more the steps that the community of Long Beach has been taking to up its resilience. So uh, Jeremy from the Chamber of Commerce and Jeff from Plenary Group. Uh, Jeremy, first, maybe you can give us a little bit of context on the city of Long Beach's risks that it faces and the chamber, in particular, how your member businesses see the community needs with respect to resilience? Sure, and no, I'll appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I think history obviously is a, is a good example and it was um, certainly highlighted in the video that we just all uh, viewed you know, going back to the 1933 uh, Long Beach earthquake. Um, I believe our anniversary is right around the corner, one that you know, shouldn't be celebrated um, in March, but one that needs to be a reminder of why um, our community needs to take notice. Um, again, going back to, to history. I think it's been also cited here a few times by some, uh, some of the panelists that, you know, California and, you know, Long Beach is no different. And certainly in the county of LA, you know, there's a, a housing shortage here. Um, so any type of interruption, damage, buildings not staying online due to a, a major event such as an earthquake, um, that just sets us back even further. Um, these um, communities um, are relying on, you know, the workforce that provides um, good jobs to our employers that are here. And then we're also a university town. Um, you know, we've got uh, close to 40,000 students at Cal State University Long Beach. Um, those students, um, while not all of them here in Long Beach, certainly many of them live here. Many of them are in affordable uh, community settings, of course, as well. So as it's been pointed out, it's just a, it's a ripple effect. If um, buildings are not resilient to a, a major event uh, here in Long Beach. And again, we'll, we'll continue to point to history and uh, make sure that uh, history does not repeat itself here in Long Beach, of course. Yeah, thank you. I know that your city in particular is located right on that uh, Palos Verde fault, and there is going to be no warring uh, in that environment. Uh, so what you do in advance of the event is especially important. Um, do you have any response or thoughts about what Lori had to say about protecting housing with retrofits um, versus new construction? Or, or how do businesses perceive that connection um, with their own future? Sure. I, I think, you know, it, it's a cost benefit analysis, right? Um, I think it's been talked about that, you know, there's several programs out there, um, you know, and I'll, and I'll back up. You know, we know we need to do this and sometimes we wait uh until it's too late to get it done you know me meaning a major event's taken place and only if we would have done it um so we need to take that only if we would have done that and really take a look at what's the cost benefit analysis and really utilizing those programs that were mentioned certainly in the video and then um, talked about here with our panelists um and, and have our um homeowners our community building owners Take advantage of that working with uh, city officials um, working with larger groups of communities um, to ensure they can uh, seek out that funding 
Um, here at the chamber, uh, we play a role of trying to gather all that information, disseminate that out there so it's as easy as possible. And uh, we again rely on our partners, whether it's both on the public side or the private side, to ensure that information is, is accessible. That's right. Um, businesses are scrambling in their day to day, especially in the climate that we're in and will be in for a while. So one thing I've seen is that these meta institutions, the federations, the associations, they can keep that long term view uh, for for their members, even as they're serving, um, you know, the daily needs, the monthly needs of their of their constituents. Um, the Long Beach Civic Center Complex um, is such an impressive project that we got to hear about in the video. Um, I'm especially intrigued by the innovative financing model, uh, all of the variety of community assets and services that are available now through that complex. It's a great example of getting out and head ahead of the threats that we face. Um, Jeffrey, I'd love if you could take the microphone now and tell us a little bit about the plenary group, uh, what kinds of projects your company does, and how this civic complex was able to come together. Sure, thank you. And thank you for having me, Cheryl. I appreciate it. Uh, it's a very important topic, I think, for all of us, this idea of resiliency. And as I kind of mentioned early in the introductions, uh, Plenary is a developer of infrastructure and, and most specifically critical infrastructure. So we look for that in all of our deals. Um, we have about 70 assets around the world, about 52 in, in North America, uh, representing a project value of just uh, on just over $30 billion US. And uh, with all of those that we've looked at in the last you know 15 years since we've been doing this, uh, they really fall mostly under a model of what we call a, a DBFOM, which is a design, build, finance, uh, operate, and maintain model. So with that, we get a, we get a contract from the city and or from the agency, the public agency that says, uh, if you do your job, we will pay you. And so if you think about the idea of resiliency, it, it becomes pretty important uh, to us getting paid. So if you're sitting in an office building right now and there was an event and let's say you couldn't get out of the building because the stairwells had collapsed or the fire alarm system didn't work one day and you couldn't come into the building, you know that you, you would get to the privilege of paying your landlord rent. Uh, in spite of the fact that you couldn't use the building. Uh, in our deal, there's a direct right of offset against that. And so that is really the, the hammer that the city or in the case of Long Beach or the public agency otherwise would use to keep us uh, motivated in the deal. And so we enter into these long-term contracts, typically 30 to 50 years to, in their, their service agreement to provide the services of designing, building, financing, operating, and maintaining it. And then that allows us to put together a creative package to minimize the cost of that bundle of services over the, the course of the contract term. Um, so how we got involved in the Long Beach Civic Center was simply... Uh, it really started with the state of California and the court system. So the Judicial Council for California was looking for maybe a better way to uh, pursue some of the needed courthouse retrofits that they needed. And there's, you know, there's never enough money and there's always a challenge when that situation exists. Uh, maintenance becomes sort of the last thing think people think about. So uh, the courts went out looking for a new model and they looked really to, to Canada where we were doing a lot of work. And they, they brought that model to California with uh, with the Long Beach Courthouse, which happened to be you know within viewing distance of the Long Beach Civic Center. So when city officials were were looking at a way to get the city hall uh, retrofits done, that they they knew they needed to do something. You know they had a seismic problem. Uh, I think since 2005 was when they did their first study, and so they said that that's maybe an expedient way to get it done and ensure that it is done in a way. That, that has resiliency and that we can then enforce if uh, the project is not is not performing or, or has an issue, we can enforce that back against the developer, which uh, really was the DBFOM model. Appreciate that. Um, I also know that the complex uh, was awarded a re resilience-based earthquake design initiative rating uh, in the READY rating certification system uh, for using design and planning criteria that enable the city hall to be ready to resume business and provide livable, usable conditions quickly after a quake. 
Um, what do you see as far as trends in your industry? Are, are more property owners and developers finding it beneficial to invest in um, both sustainability, climate um, readiness, and disaster resilient buildings? And in particular, what do you think about the value of rating systems, be they ready or USRC or otherwise? Yeah, well, I mean, certainly a rating system is is helpful because it's an easy standard for everybody to get their head around. So if you think about like LEED, for example, as a building certification, that standard was developed several years ago. Now it means something, right? Because you can say I'm in a LEED certified building and and ready is kind of a newer standard that, that was just trying to work towards something similar. Um, to, to be frank, we were a little scared of it when the city uh, first suggested it. Uh, but I think like, like, you know, the benefit of any public private partnership is you can ask for something. Um, and, and if you ask for it in terms of a performance standard, you get some creative responses. So, uh, to dive in a little bit on that, the, um, the Long Beach, uh, was Shane's, Shane's predecessor was a, a guy named uh, David Karam, who was a building official in Long Beach. And so, you know, there was a choice. He could have said, you know, we want to build this beyond code, you know, uh, put a seismic importance factor on it or something or come up with a code. But that would have been a very unilateral uh, decision that they would have made at, at City Hall based on the building code, right? Uh, so instead, what they said was, well, we're going to, we want a goal. We want to know that after an earthquake, we can experience, you know, few or no injuries, reoccupy the facility within a week, have full functionality within 30 days and less than 5% financial loss. And they said, you know, this was in a competition format. We hadn't won the project yet. So that was part of the RFP. They said, you developers and design build teams can figure out how to do that. Um, so it wasn't like they were forcing us down the ready standard. It was a little new at the time. We ended up meeting that standard, but it was really about meeting the performance goals that were important to them and important to their business operations. That's wonderful. Um, it can really help to be able to measure um, and to have those goals up front. You can find the lowest cost, most creative um, ways to do it. It gives people an edge. They can use that as a part of their competitive bid. Um, love that. So that actually dovetails well into a question that's been submitted in the chat um, from a viewer. And I'd like love for the panelists to maybe raise their hand if they'd like to take um, this question on. How do we measure the resilience of people versus infrastructure and vice versa? So what are some of the other ways we can measure resilience um, and use that in our goal setting and progress tracking? Would anybody like to take that on? Um, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> so, sure. I mean, I don't, how you, I think one of the things that, that you know, in thinking about the, the topics of this panel and, and thinking about our project, certainly in Long Beach, you know, when we, the, the, the city hall that was built in 1971 was built to a different code and had seismic challenges and it was a reason to do the project. If I'm a public works director and I'm interviewing a candidate uh, in the old building, there's a chance that they're going to walk by a cube that says, this is where all the emergency supplies are in case you're stuck in this building because you can't get out because the exit stairways could fall apart in an earthquake. It, you know, it's hard to hire that candidate, right? Um, and it's hard to keep people working in the building and motivated. So at some level there is there, that that is really part of the measure is that, you know, how do we, we, we can all be resilient and deal with adversity from a, from a, that point of view. But, you know, if we're not creating safe work environments for people, then, then that's a challenge. It's a challenge to hiring. It's a challenge to retaining employees. And, you know, do you really want to go to work or in that, or, or in that building every day? And does the public, you know, you're serving public, does that really, does that really serve the public, um, you know, having an unsafe infrastructure? Thank you. Um, Lori, maybe you want to chime in from, from your perspective. To address that question is an excellent question. I mean, here, here's where I stand with that. I mean, resiliency is about, we, we could define it in many different ways. In some courts, we define it as the ability to adapt to changing circumstances. Um, in some in some spaces, we define it as the ability to bounce back from shocks and stresses. Um, it, it also, you know, in, in its truest form, connotes the ability to be elastic, to be flexible, to be able to 
um, move with the um, scenario that you're presented with and, and come back online. And I would offer that, you know, I, the resilience of a person, of a community, um, that there is no doubt that many communities, particularly communities that have faced incredible stress um, in this country, uh, are the most, are some of the most resilient communities you will ever meet. Um, any community that has survived um, decades of prejudice, uh, uh, racism, uh, classism, uh, you know, disinvestment, redlining, um, and the list goes on, trauma, and th these communities are able to build power and strength and continue to build and, and be fortified and fortify one another is incredible. You know, you look at um, all of the, the households that have immigrated from um, other countries and have gone to incredible um, lengths to come to this nation and, and work um, so diligently and build businesses. This is resilience in action. Um, it is our obligation, I think, as a nation of some of the best expertise in the world around building infrastructure and technology to invest in ensuring that at fundamentally our buildings and our infrastructure is able to deal with events such as the snowstorm in Houston, um, events such as the flood. So I, I think the, me the way we measure um, community resiliency is very different than how we measure infrastructure resilience. And I would say that we should always consider that there is an innate resilience in so many of the communities we're serving, um, um, even more so than the buildings that we're building. Uh, one of the key indicators uh, of resiliency is the ability to bear up against shocks. And one of the impediments to the resiliency uh, profile of many buildings is the lack of operations and maintenance support that these buildings are given. Um, so just as you order a plant, if you don't maintain a building, right, it's going to fail. It's we're not going to, to survive any threat. And one of the challenges that we're confronting as a country is our infrastructure is D minus. Uh, we're not investing the kind of operations and maintenance support in the infrastructure. And um, that is a problem because it cannot survive. Um, so just as a person's immune system determines how it's going to deal with a threat such as a virus or, or bacteria, a building must also have a strong immune system. Uh, measuring the two, uh, it's a different situation, but I, I just wanted to put that forward because um, you know, there are a lot of strong links and there are a lot of weak links. It's our job to look at how do we deal with those weak links and fortify those weak links. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad you made the point um, about innate resilience. Uh, when we use the word vulnerable population, we're often not giving credit to the survival experience and knowledge that can be brought to bear. Human beings are incredibly adaptable, but we'd like to set in place programs that make it less difficult to do so. Yeah. Um, I want to actually uh, ask Lori just one more question because there's an, a new initiative afoot that you're involved in, the Resilience 21 initiative, and I wanted to give you a chance to make your pitch to the audience. Um, it's newly launched. It's focused on giving advice to the new administration about how to both focus and scale up federal support for resilience. Maybe you can just say a few words about that and how people can get involved if they're if they're interested. Sure, Cheryl, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll say that this initiative began uh, as a group of resiliency experts uh, over the holidays in January, December, where we decided we have an opportunity to do something really great uh, in this nation. Uh, we have a new administration with lots of great ideas and great vision, and the climate crisis is something that we are, as a world, confronting. Um, in such a big way. And so how can we provide our input to the administration as they're doing this great work? Uh, and so uh, several of us came together, chief resiliency uh, officers from um, around the country, uh, specifically my colleague, Norris Ajo, who's chief resiliency officer in Houston, um, and Stuart Tercozzi, who is the um, director of the Resilient Cities Network in North America, came together and said, what can we do? What is the best advice we can provide? 
And so this effort, which literally started um, in the middle of everyone's much needed break, started ballooning to about 50 plus um, resiliency experts, practitioners that work in the field, in the ground, on the ground with communities day in and day out. And we are providing guidance. We put together an agenda for the administration to be helpful and to relate what we think is the most important and most impactful way that this administration can move resiliency forward. Um, we've got about 10 leading recommendations and multiple um, action items, and it's it's intended to be practical and actionable. Um, it's already been circulating to top uh, key appointees within the administration, and it's a group that is growing. Uh, we're going to be hosting uh, active conversations, and would love to invite anyone on this call to join us. Uh, but it, it is an effort to really provide the best in class guidance, practical guidance to this administration in terms of how do we move systems thinking forward. One of the challenges with resiliency is how do we define it in action? Uh, and to me as a planner and as a resiliency practitioner, it's really about approaching problems from a systems perspective, not just looking at how can we fix that bri bridge or roadway, the question we must ask ourselves is, how can we fix the upstream and downstream issues that contribute to that road falling apart or that bridge breaking? Um, when we look at the environment, you know, we often find that flooding doesn't begin at the place where you're seeing it, right? Flooding starts 2,000 miles upstream and it, it, it hits you right at the source you need to be thinking about systems along the way to help stave off the impact at the at the end of the line. So we have to start thinking from a regional perspective, systems thinking, uh, and, and, and and through this process, there's lots of opportunities and resources to come forward. Resiliency 21, uh, you can find us, find this initiative um, on the web, uh, and we'd love to have anyone join us. We've got hundreds of folks from around the country that have already signed up and from around the world that are interested in what are we doing? Thank That's you, Cheryl, terrific. for letting me talk about that. Yeah, yeah, I, I've i been really impressed. Um, the website has some very clear, the document you produce has some very clear um, rallying points, calls to action. Um, I loved the part about community development finance and the ways that we can use our existing Community Reinvestment Act tools to help um, make sure that credit and uh, financial tools are available for these investments that we want to make happen. Um, I think there's a lot we can do. So I'd like um, to get some others to, oh, go, go yeah, ahead. Well, one thing I want to ask, and it's a question I'm interested in the group in weighing in, you know, we're, we're dealing with a, a, an economic period where we're going to have less funding coming into states and localities, and there's potential for a big infrastructure package. Um, coming forward. So how would we prioritize some of these investments? That's, that's a question I'm thinking about. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to get others to weigh in too. Um, you know, how do we come together in this moment of great need to accomplish more and more quickly? <laughs> and where do you see the opportunities? Um, maybe, Jeremy, you can tell us, I saw your head nodding while Lori was talking about uh, infrastructure investment. Tell us, uh, tell us from your perspective. Sure. What no, the opportunities are. Absolutely. No uh, infrastructure investment. Obviously, has been something that's been talked about for uh, quite a while now, going back uh, a few uh, administrations, right? So um, we are definitely interested in that. Um, not just from a uh, jobs perspective, but as been pointed out earlier, it, our infrastructure um, is failing. Our infrastructure needs help. Um, so you know, one of the um, platforms that we utilize here at the chamber is, is bringing individuals such as many of you on this panel and those in the audience um, together um, who are experts in your, your related uh, fields and having those ongoing conversations so we can pinpoint exactly um, how we you know get to that end goal you know and what is um, uh, a priority and what may sen uh, essentially might not be a priority but still certainly needs to go into a a large infrastructure package. So uh, I can speak for us here at the chamber. We are very much interested in a infrastructure package, how that all comes together. We will be actively um, advocating for that, not just for Long Beach, but our, our region here in Southern California, because we know 
um, the economic driver that we are. So um, to the extent that we can play a role, you know, count us at the table. Uh, that's excellent. Um, Shane, I'm wondering from the building official perspective, um, you know, you guys are on the ground uh, so involved in improving the built environment projects. How can building officials, you know, give their advice, have a voice in the policies and programs that are being um, planned so that they really can be implemented smoothly and quickly? I'd love to get your, your perspective on that. Absolutely. You know, I think the thing we encourage most is for uh, for folks in my field to get out of the office, you know, to uh, to engage with the development community and with our chambers of commerce prior to the projects starting. You know, if there are efficiency efforts or streamlining efforts, or even a desire for some of those. Uh, uh, processes or programs to get underway if the building official is able to engage early in those discussions. You know, like Jeremy was saying, provide that technical expertise as to what hurdles or roadblocks you might come up from a legal or from a code perspective that uh, it's, you know, it's a matter of, of applying strategy to, to how you meet those challenges, not necessarily being able to overcome them. And, you know, as the, you know, as the technical expert, the, the lead technical expert in your city or county for how uh, the code is applied and for how it's, it's developed. And then that process in the back as to uh, how plans get reviewed, how inspections occur. If we can meet our business communities uh, one on one and understand where the pressure points are that they experience in, uh, in working in our realm we're able to then look at our processes and programs and figure out how to make improvements there. We work at that intersection of building safety and economic development and need to embrace you know, both facets of what, uh, what we experience there. And the only way and the best way to do that is for us to, uh, again, get out of our offices and to, uh, to get into early meetings with the stakeholders. Yeah, getting on the same page early on is, uh, is a is a great way to find those win-win angles. Um, I've also, in my own work with cities, found that there's a lot we can do besides financial incentives to help make projects easier. So maybe it's exemption from a particular requirements and flexibility on parking rules. There's a lot under the authority of the building official that can make things go fast or slow and time is money in every development project I know. Um, Absolutely. Though much of the, the code standards we work with are, you know, what you consider on their face to be kind of inflexible, a lot of it is performance-based. And when you look at the alternative means or methods that might be available to our developers and working with them on those options and then partnering with our, uh, our colleagues in urban planning, or in uh, the other facets of our development services functions to find ways for projects to meet the goals they're looking for while still achieving the, uh, the legal constraints that your city or your county work in means, you know, it means a lot of communication. You know, if we work with the projects, you know, early on and we, uh, you know, continue to provide our insight and our information and then, you know, work with strategy that's coming from the development side, you find these things flow smoother in there. If nothing else, there are fewer surprises as you come to pressure points. That's great. That's great. Um, so, Jeffrey, if, if more money from the government side uh, potentially is coming down the pipe, that makes me think the public-private partnership model is even more important um, as a point of leverage. Maybe you could talk about some of the opportunities um, for those types of projects, how they get started, uh, which ones are needed most, what opportunities are you seeing from the real estate financing perspective? Yeah, I mean, cer certainly, you know, more money is needed. I think there's a number of uh, reports around that say we've got a, like a $4 trillion deficit in infrastructure in the country, something along those lines. Um, 
And uh, as, as Laurie pointed out, a lot of it is really that, that there's usually we can find enough money to build something, but we rarely find enough to maintain it. And I think one of the one of the critical tenants of our public private partnerships is that the maintenance is funded. So as officials are looking at these projects and they're approving them, it's not just uh, uh, getting it built and doing the ribbon cutting, it's providing for future generations as well and, and long-term resiliency in the community. So this infrastructure continues to function. Um, and I, I, I think that's just, that's a fundamental tenant. And of course, uh, bringing financing to the equation as well helps, helps leverage existing public money to make it go a little further. Um, I don't know if I can answer the question of how to triage. There's, there's, there's going to be more need than there is funding, and that's really going to be up to every, every community to do. I know Jeremy's, Jeremy's not in his head. I, I think the, the Gerald Desmond Bridge is a classic example of that, right? A third of the country's freight was going over that bridge, and it was falling off the bottom until they re replaced it with a new one. So I'm glad we replaced it before we had a real crisis to deal with. So. Well, that's excellent. Um, I'd like to see if anyone on the panel has questions for someone else on the panel, something that they've brought up that's of interest to you. Um, Lori asked something earlier that we didn't get a chance to circle on right at that moment, but give it, give a moment to see if there's someone here that has an answer to a challenge you're facing in your work. I'll, I'll take a stab at it, um, and maybe it's more of a comment, um, a general comment, and then we can you know, certainly follow up um, offline and, and certainly on our side is that, you know, we talked about it's needed, it needs to happen now, but where is that funding going to come from? And we talked a little bit about in the videos of certain programming and everything, and um, I can tell you on our side, when we push um, to make sure our uh, building owners, our members are resilient. Um, they're going to ask, okay, Jeremy, I'll do that. But where's the funding going to come from? Well, I need some assistance because this is, again, about the greater good of the community. So um, I would just challenge our, our panelists and you know, those watching that to the extent that folks can um, load us up with you know, answers to those questions on where that funding comes from. Or if we need to go out and find uh, more funding you know, from various package like the infrastructure package we talked about, um, or the opportunity to well, then let us know because then we'll we'll go to work on lobbying and, and working with our electeds um, to make sure that happens here in Long Beach. That's great. Um, go ahead. I think that was really terrific, Jeremy, what you said, and I'm really happy that we're talking about the sort of nuts and bolts of of, um, of, of operations, maintenance, and new construction. I think one of the issues that we have to look at as a community practitioners is the multiple benefits that we reap that are yielded when we invest in um, resilient businesses, resilient homes, infrastructure. Um, you know, we talk about the issue of return on investment and it's a very transactional uh, conversation typically. So how much am I gonna get in return? How much money am I gonna get in return for um, this investment in enterprises, CDFI? So we're used to having those conversations, but there's a bigger conversation at hand which is how can we evaluate and value the um, benefit to a community when a school is um, in full mast operation or when a bridge is able to uh, bear up 20, 30 years of pressure and stress? Um, or even what does it mean to have affordable housing in a community? What is the multiple benefits to the community's economy? And I think COVID has laid bare uh, what happens when we're not prepared? You know, I live here in Brooklyn, in New York City, and I mean half of the city's Class A commercial real estate is empty. We've got empty storefronts on every single block. I've never seen anything like it. Um, and so, you know, what are the multiple benefits to putting those systems back in operation? And it's more than just a direct short-term transaction. So this is a question, you know, Jeremy, Jeff, Ali, Shane, do you do you think about multiple benefits in your work, and how do, how do we translate this? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take a stab. Again, we, we think about it every day, right? Obviously, as as I mentioned, if you if you build a building that that isn't safe to occupy, you it's really hard to hire employees. If we build a bridge that doesn't last for thirty years, we don't get paid based on our our performance regimes. So you know we're we're always looking at at the longevity of a of a given asset, and uh, you have to think about those multiple benefits. 
Yeah, that we, we look at it the same way from the government side, you know, that the uh, you know, the standards that we're enforcing and the, the, the work we do in partnership with the private sector, you know, doesn't have a singular effect or a singular benefit. And as we move into a post-COVID world, looking at what mixed use occupancy looks like, you know, how many people are going to be continuing to work some degree from home and what's that going to do to office space or a lack thereof in that need area and how you can repurpose that. It's very multifaceted. Appreciate that. Uh, we have come to the close of our time for panel questions. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful to each of you for bringing your experience and thoughts to our audience and to this important conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a few wrap up words coming from Evan Reese of USRC. And just if we could applaud for you, we would. If we could pat you on the back, we would. Um, but just keep going. It's the small wins. It's the people you work with that keep um, that keep you going in this very difficult um, environment, long term challenge that we have. So thank you very much, everybody. On to Evan. Well, thank you, Cheryl. And uh, a huge thank you to our panelists, <clears throat> to Shane Diller, the president of Calbo, Jeremy Harris, uh, the president of the Long Beach Chamber. Jeffrey Fullerton, uh, Senior VP of the Plenary Group, and Lori Schumann, um, President uh, with Enterprise Community Partners. Um, I'll just say, as part of a wrap up, one thing that I've really taken away, not only from developing the, the video episode that you saw, but also clearly uh, with the panel today, is something we mentioned that everything is really interconnected. Um, I got to be honest, this is one of the things that I, uh, why I'm such a big fan of Lori's and of the work that Enterprise Community Partners does, because they really showed me at this uh, conference she mentioned that they had a few years ago, how interconnected things are and how much benefit everybody receives by making our infrastructure and the people that access that infrastructure more resilient. Uh, and then the U.S. Resiliency Council has been collaborating for several years now with Calbo on initiatives. Um, that uh, at the state level can promote resilience. Uh, and I'm really glad to meet um, uh, Jeremy and Jeffrey. Um, every time I hear uh, developers and folks from chambers of commerce speak on this subject, it pleasantly surprises me how engaged they are and how important they see their role in the community as the businesses they support or the companies they run in making communities stronger and more resilient. So I couldn't be happier uh, to have them bring their perspectives. So next time, next month, uh, we're going to be talking about retrofit design. Uh, one of the things that we learned from our previous episode on new design was that when it comes to making buildings more resilient, it actually doesn't cost that much. It's very efficient to do it, particularly uh, with new buildings. But even with retrofits, there's a lot of great technologies and great work out there that's being done to take some of our older buildings, some of our historic buildings, and make them resilient as well. The champions for that episode are going to be the LA County Business Federation uh, and the Los Angeles Conservancy. And then in April, uh, our, su our subject will be on the confluence of sustainability uh, and resilience to really redefine what that term sustainability is. Green design and resilient design working together to truly make a sustainable uh, uh, community environment. Uh, and the U.S. Green Buildings Council, uh, L.A. Uh, chapter, and the Los Angeles Area Chamber will be our uh, champions for that. So with that, I am just going to turn it over to Ali to, to close us out. And again, thank you to our panelists and everybody that's attended. Thank you, uh, Cheryl. Thank you, Evan, for your great work. Thank you, the panelists. It was really in enlightening. The conversation was uh, really interesting. We really appreciate all the great work you all do. At this time, I'd like to uh, thank a couple of members of my team that have made tremendous com uh, contribution this last few months. Uh, as we've been producing this. One is uh, uh, Tom Robinson and Andrea Aguilar. They've both been working day and night supporting, working with the U USRC team. 
and the wonderful production team of Compassion Unlimited, David Sharf and his uh, team to produce this, uh, this program. I just want to uh, thank you guys. You're doing a great job and I appreciate it personally. Also, uh, we would like to recognize the organizations that have been serving as our promotional partners. Each of these groups have been very generous in carrying our program announcement to their members. There are dozens of these uh, organizations uh, that are gonna be listed here and we appreciate uh, their support. The one thing that really came across here for me, it's uh, something that uh, uh, the inner connection to all of our uh, different parts of our society, our residences, our residential communities, what happens when they're damaged or on, uh, they're not habitable? Well, if, if I am a resident, um, you know, and I cannot house my family, am I going to be able to focus on going to work? Of course not. I have to take care of them. The vice versa, if a business is damaged and is not habitable, a business space, what happens there? Then I won't have, as an employee of that business, I won't have a paycheck the ability to work and put food on the table. Government, of course, uh, if we don't produce, there isn't any revenue. If there are no sales, if the businesses are down, closed, the same thing with nonprofits. These are the foundations of our society. They provide a lot of services to us. So this diagram represents the kind of inner connections of how close we are each other and what what is good for one is certainly good for the other with that in mind i appreciate all of you watching us across the country in california and across the world thank you so much have a beautiful afternoon